So today we're going to go over something by a guy called James Ball and he's looked at the impact assessments basically and broken it down into a couple of key sectors. Now here's the thing when you're looking at those leaked impact assessments. Those told us nothing new. The experts had been saying it right from the beginning that economically Brexit was going to be a disaster. We will end up um, weaker, poorer and smaller for it. These are not advantages that, that you know, <laughs> Brexit gives us nothing. It takes from us and leaves us worse off. So over to his sort of big picture analysis. So the leaked impact assessments reveal that the government believes that if the UK engages in a hard Brexit, leaving the customs union and the single market, our economy will be 8% smaller in 15 years time than it would have been if the UK didn't leave the EU. On that face, it doesn't look particularly dramatic, as ministers hurried to point out that the assessment still believes that the UK economy will grow medium to long term and 8% doesn't feel like a drastic figure. In the real world, however, this is huge. In practical terms, an economy 8% smaller than it otherwise should have been is an economy 200 billion a year worse off, an amount roughly equivalent to 650 pounds for every single household in the country. For the government, that means around 88 billion less in revenue every year. That's enough money to hire a million doctors, build more than 500,000 social homes, or to cover the entire cost of the UK military and education systems at the same time when the government finances are under huge pressure. This is a vast sum of money to give up, and one which could be reduced marketably. A Brexit that would see the UK remain in the single market and customs union would, on the analysis, leave the UK economy just 2% smaller than a no-Brexit scenario, leaving the country £150 billion a year better off, and the government with a £600 billion a year more than it would have otherwise. So now we move on to the regional impact. So a key argument deployed between Brexiteers is that the EU will be forced to give uh, the UK a good Brexit deal because they rely on our ability to sell goods to the UK. Because the EU sells more goods to the UK than UK ships the other way around, they say that they will be desperate to strike a generous deal to preserve that trade. Analysis by the University of Birmingham, however, suggests something very different. The academics used international trade data to see how reliant different regions of the UK and across the EU were on trade with the EU versus the rest of the world to suggest how severe an impact of leaving would be in different areas. The first finding was a severe blow to anyone hoping that the EU would be desperate to strike a generous Brexit deal. The UK is far more exposed to severe economic impact from a post-Brexit loss of trade than almost all other EU nations, who would see relatively small losses. The main exception uh, is certain regions of Ireland, which would see a smaller loss than most of the UK, but a sizable and a damaging effect on their economies. When the UK, um, when it comes to the UK exposure, the research found, generally speaking, around a 12% of GDP was exposed to Brexit versus the less than 3% across the EU, meaning the UK has far more to lose from a bad deal or a breakdown in talks. The research also found that regions which voted for Brexit are generally more exposed to the negative effects of leaving. London, the research found, traded far more globally than, the, than most areas of the UK, leaving it potentially more resilient to a post-Brexit future. 
Regions which voted heavily for Brexit, including areas in the northeast of England, Yorkshire and the Midlands, risk losing much more substantial chunks of their economy in the post-Brexit future um, future uh, talks, trade talks with the EU. Cumbria faces the highest exposure to Brexit, with a 16% 16 of its GDP relying on EU trade, followed closely by Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and North Somerset. The UK government has prepared a detailed analysis of expectional regional of impact, which is helped by David Davis's depart from Eg Department for Exiting the European Union, but is currently resisting releasing the information to MPs or the public. So, given the fact that once again they're withholding this information, that basically means it's not good news. So, education. So far, the UK's universities seem to be bearing up well under Brexit. The most recent data, data shows an increase in applications from EU nations, a welcome boost for a sector which serves as one of the one of the EU which serves as one of the UK's key exports. Overseas students are coming to the UK to provide substantial income to universities, while their other spending while well, their other spending in the country. Uh, while they are stomaging, will provide a much broader boost to businesses. More broadly, though, uh, people in the sector are worried. Many academics working in the UK are not UK citizens, and international competition for talent is fierce. The University College London reported last year that 95% of its academics were EU nationality had received approaches from competitor universities in other EU countries to leave, and other universities report similar, similar concerns um, around attracting and keeping talent. The UK also stands to lose um, access to several huge pots of research funding controlled by the UK, including an £80 billion Horizon 2020 Science Research Fund. At present, the UK is keen to negotiate the remaining part of this and the other schemes, but nothing has, of yet has been agreed. The financial sector. The public is perhaps justifiably not particularly fond of bankers, but their contribution to the economy is huge. The UK imports far more goods than we export, but we balance it by exporting far more services, such as banking, legal advice and consultancy than we import. These sectors are the engines of the UK economy and I've said this before in other videos, in most trade deals services such as this are not on the table. You are kidding if you think that the uh, US is going to allow Britain to have access to its financial services. So this does not bode well for a post-Brexit future. Most hard Brexit plans for the UK's future uh, with Europe involve the UK signing a future trade deal with Europe that will likely that will be likely to cover goods but not services, meaning it will be harder for the UK to export services as we do now. Um, Prince Wardhouse Cooper. Cooper studied the likely effect of a hard Brexit on the UK financial sector and said that the impacts would be significant in the short term and they said that the banks would create new legal structures to allow them to continue trading as they do now, a process which has already begun. But in the long term, jobs and businesses would be relocated out of the country. The effect of this would estimate on the, on this they estimate would result in the UK eventually losing around eight billion a year of trade in financial services alone, between seventy thousand and a hundred thousand fewer jobs in the skilled and high paying sectors by twenty thirty. Now we move on to fishing, which is something that got talked a lot about in the referendum. So the fisheries sector is not a huge portion of the UK economy but is a symbolically important one in the mind of many Brexiteers. Resentment over EU rules on fishing and quota limits is one of the longest-running gripes against the EU. However, 
Fishing does not stand to be an obvious or easy winner after Brexit, with the UK facing the prospect of trying to renegotiate decades-old agreements where uh, governing where UK boats can fish and, crucially, where they can sell their catches. Many of the fish caught in UK boats and waters are not sold in the UK because of different food uh, preferences in the UK versus some of our European neighbours. As a result, the UK exports just under €100 billion a year worth of fish to EU countries, a trade which could be severely damaged in a hard Brexit scenario in which the EU imposed tariffs on the UK. Even more significantly, a report prepared by the EU notes that the UK would lose automatic access to fish in EU waters, with these rights being redistributed among other nations. That doesn't matter a great deal to Scottish fishers, who largely stay within, EU, within UK waters, but the English fleet is hugely reliant on fishing in international waters. Most critically, UK boats catch most of the cod they take, they take from Norwegian waters, meaning Brexit could, ha could pose something of a risk to fish and chips. Something of a very much a British institution. And those are just the breakdowns of those sectors and those that we know have been done so far. Yet, um, big catalyst. And what was so funny was you came out and Jacob Rees-Mogg did the rounds. He went on everything and basically said, oh, pff, no, this is, these, these reports are faked. This is just sabotage. These reports were not sabotaged. You cannot just go around saying every single time you see a report to something you don't like and just say, that's false, it's, it's fake, it's sabotaged. That, that calls into question huge amounts of data gathering that, you know, the government does. Because you want the, you, the government to gather data on impact, on things it's doing, things it might want to do in the future. This is important, and it's a key function you want the government to be carrying out. But out comes Jacob Bongs goes, oh no, sabotaged.